Hello everyone. So we're just waiting for people to roll in before we start, but hi, hi, hi. So we're going to be starting really soon. Wonderful. I can see participants rolling in, which is great. Hi to everyone. Okay, wonderful. Let's start, shall we? Let's go on to the first slide. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thanks to everyone for joining today's webinar for the University of London's Bachelor's Degree of Computer Science Programme. Um, my name's Nisha, I'm an enrolment counsellor, and joining me today, we have Diana and Matthew, fellow enrolment counsellors. They are going to be monitoring the live chat, answering any questions, and we also have Naomi today. He'll be monitoring the slides for us as well. Um, I'm also excited to announce that we will be having uh, Dr. Matthew Yee King joining us in today's webinar uh, shortly. But in today's webinar, we have a lot to cover. So we're going to start off with the program where you'll get to learn more about the program structure and the overview and what the online format really looks like. Then we'll delve into fees, admissions, application processes, and then we'll end off with a really exciting live QA. So you know, as you go along the presentation, feel free to type in your questions, anything that you have for the program director, please pop it in with um, directed for him. And then, you know, we'll answer them as much as we can. So let's get started. Let's go on to the next slide. Great. So let's look at program structure and overview. The program is between three to six years, which means you can complete the degree as quick as three years if you study full time or you have up to six years to complete all 23 modules at your own pace. A semester is 22 weeks long, which is roughly around six months. Um, and you can study up to four modules per semester, which is considered a full-time course load. Two to three modules is part-time. You have the amazing flexibility to choose and vary your course load. You can even take a semester off if you need to. Whatever you decide to do, it will just determine how quickly you finish the degree. So if you like to start off with two modules in your first term or three or four, you absolutely can. It's really down to you. I'd say the majority of students who are working full time and studying tend to take about two to three modules per term and they'll finish the degree within four to five years. Moving on to the curriculum. The curriculum is designed to give you a strong foundation in computer science and specialized knowledge of topics such as data science, AI and web development. It covers industry and academic case studies to help you apply what you've learned in terms of real world problems. And throughout the program, you'll create a portfolio of coursework and projects to present to employers. Now in the UK, a bachelor's degree is typically three years, which is why you'll see that the program structured into three levels, levels four, five, and six. Um, this follows the UK framework of higher education. So each module is worth 15 credits and the final project is worth 30. So altogether, you'll complete 360 credits to earn your bachelor's degree of computer science. And in the program, you will learn programming languages such as JavaScript, C++, uh, Python, and C Sharp. In level four, you'll complete eight compulsory modules covering the fundamentals, including computer programming with a special project on web applications. This is where you'll learn JavaScript and cover the client side of web languages such as HTML and CSS. Progressing on to level five, where you'll complete another eight compulsory modules covering programming skills, where you'll learn to load JS and build web server applications and data applications like SQL. Then you'll move on to C++, which sets you up for physical computing and games development. You'll also tackle Python in the modules, um, which will set you up for AI and machine learning. And you'll do some work with C Sharp using Unity framework in the game modules. In level six, you'll complete six elective modules along with a final project that combines your knowledge and skills to create a software system in line with your specialism. Everybody takes the same modules at levels four and five and level six is where you differentiate. So you have time to change or register on a specialism up until you reach level six modules. If you choose to do the general route, you'll have a bit more flexibility to choose your level six modules and the final project, which is based on. The final project consists of both coursework and a written exam with 80 to 20 weighting ratio, including a proposal, a progress log, reports, and a presentation. So just to let you know, there are no live lectures, but there are live webinars hosted by tutors. The tutors run these live webinars at different times, um, twice a week, 
then this is a great opportunity to go through the coursework covered that week and receive guidance on assessments. They're super helpful. So you'll find that some live webinars, tutors will share even additional insights. Um, and you'll also get to interact with your classmates, joining from all over the world. So I highly encourage you to attend them if you can. But if you can't, don't worry. They will be recorded for you to watch back at a later date. And just another note is that they tend to host a few more webinars on the math components of the program to provide extra support. So if you're anything like me, you would love to have a little bit more math guidance, then your tutors are there to support you. Now, let's go on to the next slide. Great. So the program is delivered entirely online through Coursera. It's the same degree you'd receive if you were studying on campus. And the transcripts won't state it's online. As this is an online course, no live attendance is required. With it being online, you can really study at your own schedule from the comfort of your own home or wherever you are and log in. Um, in terms of time commitment, you can expect to complete an average of five to seven hours per week for one module, and it's up to you about how you manage that time. Um, those hours do include watching pre-recorded video lectures, completing quizzes, programming assignments, readings, and peer reviews. Aside from Coursera, you'll also need to regularly check your student portal through the university. The student portal is a gateway to all your additional learning resources, which include your virtual learning environment. Here you'll find the most up-to-date information, including registration dates, exam dates, as well as wonderful resources to support your development, such as well-being material, career development exercises, and student support, such as Talk Campus. Um, and as you can see here from the screen, if you've already taken a course on Coursera before, the setup will look really familiar to you. I'd always recommend to anyone uh, considering studying a degree program online to try out the platform first. It's a great opportunity to get a feel for the program, before committing long term. Uh, University of London does offer some great open content courses if you want to take a look. Um, Matt will share this in the chat box below. Okay, so like I said, what a typical day would look like is that you'll log onto the Coursera platform, you'll see all the courses you register for on your dashboard and everything's broken down into weekly pre-recorded video lectures, programming assignments and quizzes. Um, and you can study at your own schedule from anywhere in the world, so long as you have computer and internet access. Something to also highlight is that throughout each course, you'll see discussion prompts as you move through the content. These are check-in points to ensure that you participate and interact with your peers in the programme. Okay, and another thing that you should know is about exams. So exams are being taken place online due to COVID-19, but this is being consistently reviewed. You will be informed if exams will be sat in virtually or in person. Um, if online, they will take place through the University of London's virtual learning environment and our timed assessments. Exams will take place Monday to Saturday and are typically two hours, multiple choice and objective based where you can type your code into a text editor. Um, exams take place at the end of the term, which will always be around September and March, and you're given a 24 hour window to access your exam modules. So once you begin attempts, you have at least the allotted two hours to start. Brilliant, let's go on to the next slide. tuition. So I know a lot of students ask about this, so I'm going to go through this in detail. If you have any questions, pop them into the chat and we'll go through these. Tuition is based on your residency and not nationality. It's pay per module. There are different fees based on if you live in band A, band B or the UK. If you don't know which country band you fall under, you can check the university's website. Diana will be adding the link for the country bands in the chat box below. Here on the screen, you can see that this is a range from band A to band B. And this is the total indicated cost of the program for all 23 modules. If you live in band A, the total indicated cost is 11,915. Each module is 467 pounds. If you live in band B, the total indicated cost is 17,849 and each module is 702. If you live in the UK, the total indicated cost is 16,203 and each module is 636. You can find details about your module fees here on the university's website. Matthew will be dropping this into the chat box below. Tuition is paid twice a year before the beginning of each term, mid-March and mid-September. You only pay for however many modules you're going to study in each term. You only pay your tuition fees directly to the University of London's through your student portal. Students can pay their fees online via credit card, debit card, bank transfer, or even Flywire, or if they want to do it offline via Western Union Quick Pay, Sterling Bankers Draft and Check. You can check the university's page on how to pay your fees. 
for more details. Diana will be dropping this into the chat box below now. The university offers scholarships and bursaries. Learners must check the eligibility requirements before applying. Matt's gonna drop this into the chat box below now for you to review. The programme is eligible for student finance for UK residents and students can apply for student finance for part-time and full-time loans, but are not eligible for the maintenance loan. And to apply for the programme, the University of London will now charge an application processing fee of £107. This is non-refundable and non-transferable, and the £107 is a processing fee for the application. There's no guarantee of an offer, but the best way to make sure you are offered a place on the course is to make sure you complete the application in full with the documents required, including transcripts, English language certificate, and the fees will be charged at the end of your application, so make sure you pay that in full before continuing. So let's go on to the next slide. Great, so to start, there are two admissions routes into the programme, their standard and performance. Given that applicants come from many different countries, the university accepts qualifications from all over the world. So the best way to check if you meet the academic and ad admissions requirements is to go directly to the university's website, select from the drop down countries of which you completed your education in to see what's acceptable. Diana's gonna drop this into the chat box below now so you can just double check whilst we're on the webinar. To give you an example, standard entry route, if you've completed your education in the UK, you'll need at least three UK GCSEs from a grade A to C, two UK A levels from a grade A to E, and maths, and maths needs to be included at either GCSE or IA level. So if you meet those requirements, you're eligible for standard. However, if you don't meet those requirements, you may still be eligible to apply through performance. So for the performance-based route, it's for applicants who don't meet the standard entry requirements. In order to be eligible for the performance-based route, you'll need to meet at least one of the following requirements. Again, let's use the UK for example. You'll need at least four UK GCSEs or relevant work experience in the industry. If you meet one of those requirements, you'll be eligible to apply for the performance-based route and your application would be reviewed on an individual basis. If you're accepted through this, you'll need to pass both Introduction to Programming 1 and Computational or Discrete Mathematics with a weighted average of 40% or above in order to progress into the programme. And to clarify, you'll take those modules once the session begins. These modules are part of the programme, all students must take them, but just to note that you'll only be able to study part-time until you've completed the modules first. So let's go on to the next slide. Thank you. So applications are now open and they will close on March 13th of 2023. So to start your application, you can apply online through the University of London. If you're unsure as to which admissions route you're eligible for, the university recommends that you apply through standard entry. And if you don't meet the standard entry requirements, your application will automatically be considered for performance. I'm gonna break down a few of the application components to ensure you can submit a strong and complete application and hopefully calm a few nerves. So let's go through it. So firstly, you'll need to upload a scanned copy of your ID. Um, this can be a birth certificate, a driver's license, a passport. You, secondly, you'll need to write a personal statement of 100 to 250 words. Um, and the question is, why do you wish to study for the program? So I would say, write down you know, your career aspirations, why you think you'd be a good fit and why the University of London should look at you. You'll then need to upload a scanned copy of all your academic transcripts and certificates. Um, if your documents are not in English, you'll need to provide English translated copies. The fourth point is you'll need to upload your resume. So ensure you update all your information and highlight any successes in your career. The fifth point is you've if you've completed any relevant courses or certificates like the ones on Coursera or at work, you can upload those documents as well. Number six. If English isn't your first language, you will need to submit an English proficiency test score. However, if you're working in the medium instruction of English with your employer over 18 plus months, then you can provide a letter from your employer stating this. Or if you studied in the past five years in English or an institution that English was the main language, you can also use this as evidence too. And my last point is altogether the application should take about 20 to 30 minutes to complete and you will then be asked to pay for the £107 application fee. Like I said, it's non-refundable, non-transferable. Um, you will need to submit the payment and then your application will go free. Okay, so now that we've completed that, I wanna give you a peek behind the curtains of what happens when you submit your application to the University of London. So let's go on to the next slide. 
Thank you. So for those in the process of applying, like I said, the deadline to submit your application is March 13th of this year. After you submitted your application, you'll receive a confirmation email that your application has been received by the admissions office and a notification of your student reference number. Each application gets reviewed by the admissions committee and you'll receive communication within five to 15 business days via email. If you're missing any documents, the university will reach out to you to request further evidence, so keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, you'll receive a decision on whether you've been accepted through standard or performance-based. If you don't meet the admissions requirement, the admissions committee will advise you on any additional qualifications you may need in order to be eligible for the program. After you received your offer letter email, you'll find information regarding how to log into your student portal with a new username and password to register for your modules and to access your orientation course. For those who have already received an offer, congratulations for that. But the next step to, is starting your studies to register and pay for your modules via the student portal. The University of London are offering an exciting promotion that if you register before the February 27th, you will receive free access to one of the following certificates. You can either get access to the Google IT support certificate, which will give you credit for the How Computers Work module, or you can get started on the University of London's Introduction to Computer Science and Programming Specialisation. This will introduce you to a number of themes drawn from the computer science degree. So if you're ready to start studying, then I would really recommend that you get onto this promotion. Please register before February the 27th and take advantage of those certificates above. Please ensure when registering that your module selection does not include the How Computers Work module, which you will be applying credit against. Please refer to your offer letter for more details on the registration process and key information. So once you've paid for your modules and a month before the beginning uh, of the program starts, you will receive an email invite to link your Coursera account. You'll then need to complete your orientation course, which covers everything you need to get started in the program, such as how to navigate Coursera, program policies and communication channels to speak and help connect with your peers. You will need to pass all the quizzes in the orientation course with at least 80% or above to receive access to your modules. But I can assure you, as someone who's done the orientation course themselves, it's really not that hard. The session begins on April 17th of 2023, and you will receive an announcement once as soon as your access to your registered modules become available. If you don't receive access to your modules when the session begins, I would really advise students to contact bsccs.support at london.ac.uk using the same email address you registered for with your degree program. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, well, thanks so much for listening so far. I appreciate it. And thank you to Matthew and Diana, who I can see have been answering questions whilst the presentation has been going along. And to those who have been asking questions, I really appreciate your interest and candor. We're now going to do a really exciting live Q&A session with Dr. Matthew King, who I'm super excited to introduce you all to. And some of the questions that we have here today have been asked by prospective students joining us. So thank you so much for sending in those beforehand. And if you have any more questions you'd like to ask the program director, please drop them into the Q&A chat box and label it for Dr. Matthew E. King. And we'll answer the questions that left at the end of today's session. But to the most exciting part, let's introduce our program director for the BSc Computer Science webinar. Hi, Matthew. Lovely to meet you. How are you today? Hello, nice to meet you and great to be here. Hopefully you can hear me. I'll just make sure that you can. <laughs> I can hear you loud and clear. Can Excellent. you hear me? Yes. Um, I was going to do, I've got a little gimmick lined up for everyone today, actually. Uh, so let me just do my gimmick and <laughs> then we'll I love some that. serious stuff. Right. So what I wanted to do now, you might notice that that my uh, background replacement is slightly better than the usual uh, Zoom one. And there's a reason for that, which is that um, I'm actually uh, uh, sitting in our studio and I was going to attempt to show you our studio a huge personal risk, you know, taking a risk here because uh, everything could go wrong. But I just wanted to very quickly just show you. Yeah, here we go. It's working now. Right. So here's our. Uh, this is where I am. So that's me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and oh, cool. what I'm doing is I'm actually sitting in our studio, which we've uh, which is where we've shot loads of the videos that you'll see on the BSC. And nobody has seen this. And I don't think many students have seen this. So this is a bit of a first for you guys. Uh, so yeah, so this is how it all works. We've got this kind of, this is our little kind of control pad here. Let's just do a live edit. So I press buttons on there and you can see things change 
and it's all very exciting. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, and then back to the, and that's my iPhone camera and got some <laughs> soundproofing over there, microphones, um. my, my, my good friend, colleague, Andrea is sitting over there. Sorry, Andrea. He's, he uh, has developed a lot of some of the interactive activities on the, on the course that you'll experience. We can talk a bit more about those in a minute, maybe. Oh, and no. yeah, I just thought I'd do that. So that's the end of my, my gimmick. Thank you very much <laughs> for bearing with me there. I love the gimmick. How there cool. Oh my God, I love it. So snazzy. Well, thank you so much for joining us and to Andrea in the back as well. Um, I think it's great. I was going to say, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, I know myself, my colleagues and all the students are super excited to be asking you all these questions. Um, I know that the questions that we have have been asked by students today. So we're going to go through them. Um, but thank you so much. Let's, let's start off, shall we? Let's kick it off. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, great. So my first question, Matthew, is how can students access academic support during their studies? Can they connect with their professors if they have questions about the topic? Uh, yeah, so I think you mentioned earlier that we have these kind of webinars, but before we get into that de detail, there's it's worth saying that there are two, generally two student support models, and we have the web supported learner, which is uh, someone who uh, is supported uh, through the University of London support system where and we have teaching centre learners who attend a local teaching centre and then they get uh, support from local lecturers there. So probably many of you want to talk about the web supported learner. So what we're doing now is uh, we've sort of the last couple of sessions we've rolled out a, a sort of timetabled set of webinars. So what happens at the beginning of term uh, we publish webinars for all of the courses and you can go there and, and they're run by members of faculty at Goldsmiths and you, you know, and you can attend those if you're on that module and ask questions live and have them answered. And we've set them up, so there's one at the beginning of term to kind of kick everyone off. And then there's one in the midterm, which is near to the assessment so that you can ask questions. So the, the, the person who set the assessment will go through it and explain what it's all about and you can ask questions there. And then we have one towards the end when there's the sec the uh, second assessment and that's either an exam or a second coursework and so again you can kind of contact the faculty there but beyond that we've also got the online tutors so uh, every uh, every course has multiple online tutors in it and especially the larger courses like the maths course uh, mm -hmm. they run lots of webinars and, and, and what we do is we make sure that all of the tutors webinars are available to all students even if you're not in that particular tutor group so it means if you're in a big module, especially the maths ones where people need, need a lot of help, there's webinars yeah. happening all the time so you can drop in and talk to those tutors. So those are the main sort of live contact points. That's great. I think it's great as well for students who may feel a bit uncomfortable with maths. I know for me, I was always not that great on maths. Having that tutor support, especially on web support, I think that's great. And yes, also fantastic point about the teaching centres. If students are interested in going to teaching centres, you can have a look. I'll put it into the chat box below, but it will differ on the price as well. So have a look into that. But that's great. Thank you so much. Let's go on to the next question. So second question came in from a student um, based in the Netherlands. They were saying, given the nature of the online programme, how do students socialise and network with one another? Oh, so that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so one thing which I personally I didn't really anticipate with, with this degree. So we launched it in 2019. And uh, what, what I didn't anticipate is that the, the there'd be this fantastic student community on the degree. Maybe it should have been obvious. I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, with such a large group of people. So there's we've got something like 5000 students on the degree now and they have a a workspace uh, on Slack uh, just for people on the degree and I mean and, and there's all kinds of channels on there it's, it's totally student-led so you know we don't really interfere with it from our side but uh, we, we just have us we just jump in there if people start arguing or whatever basically and tell us <laughs> we're not they're not happy that's the only time we would go in there but normally it's um there's, there's all kinds of cool stuff I've heard about happening in there there are study groups uh, you know people on each module have their groups but also um, you know, we, we run some of the group work in, in that in Slack as well. So there's a couple of modules that have group work. And again, it's not exactly socialising uh, yeah. when, when you're doing your work, but still it's another opportunity for contact points. And yeah, and it's worth knowing, you know, 
being such a big cohort, we're in how many countries are in? I, I looked at it the other day. It's like over 150 countries, okay. over 100 languages, first languages spoken, or whatever. You know, it's a it's an amazing set of people that you will not be in contact, such close contact with at any point. You know, it's a unique opportunity to do that for networking, just for meeting people from different places, whatever yeah. it is. So yeah, so that's something. As I said, I didn't really anticipate, but that's a fantastic feature of the degree that you'll you'll have access to. I think that's wonderful. No, I totally understand. You're going to be speaking to people from all over the globe, you know, that you wouldn't really not have the chance if you were doing it on campus. But I think it's great. Hopefully not any fights and just all wonderful messages over Slack. I heard there's a recipe <laughs> club. Is that true? There's very few fights. You know, it's the internet, <laughs> <Yeah>. remember. <laughs> well, that's true. You make a very good point on that. Yeah. But no, that's wonderful. OK, let's go on to the next question then. So this question came in um, actually a few weeks ago. How can students access academic support during their studies? Um, yeah, so I guess that's so I've answered a little bit of that about the kind of live uh, the live webinar. So that's one one aspect of that. Uh, but also, you know, as I say, if you're a web supported learner, you will be assigned a tutor for each module you're in. So let's say studying four modules, you'll have four kind of assignments of tutors. And then they, they, what they do is they run a, 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 a special tutor forum on the Coursera platform where yeah. you can post questions and, and have those answered. Um, and then I guess sort of in a wider pastoral support, uh, you know, because academic support is, is not a totally a clear line between, OK, I'm, I'm asking a question about this particular module and I'm asking a question about, I don't know, a deadline or something like that. Yeah. So, some, so there's also the, you know, the, the support system from University of London, which is the uh, there's a sort of dedicated team at University of London who support students on the degree with, with any kind of general queries, especially administrative. OK, well, that's really good. And I think I was going to ask this question as well. It kind of relates to about tutors. How long is a response time to hear back from tutors? If a student has a question they want to understand, how usually long does it take? Yeah, so we would expect it to be, um, you know, uh, within within a day or two normally. And what, what, as I say, also we have kind of within within the larger modules. In fact, most of the modules, we have an additional layer of, of uh, tutor support. So, um, what we found is over time we built up this this set of some tutors who are really good and very experienced. Yeah. And what some of them operate as what we call enhanced tutors. And enhanced mm -hmm. tutors kind of they they sit across the forum so if a question doesn't get answered quickly enough they're kind of they've got a check-in thing they're monitoring uh, how fast things are being checked and they'll jump in and, uh, and you know find out why it's not being answered and then answer it themselves if necessary so there's a kind of couple of layers there and yeah so that's how we manage that well I think that's fantastic it's make sure that you know all the students questions are being addressed which is great of course that's what you need especially for an online program but that's yeah. fab thank you let's go on to the next question Great. So we get this question a lot and I'd love to have a bit more clarity on this. If students are accepting through performance based entry, what does that mean for the student exactly? Uh, oh, I should have got my picture ready for this. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> so essentially it means um, yeah, should I try and find the picture? I could draw the picture for you. OK. Oh, do you know um, what? I'd love that. Um, like, since I've got all this stuff set up. I might oh, well. absolutely. There we go. Look, oh, there, wow. Wonderful. Here's, here's a here's a here's a live demo for it. So the degree looks like this okay it's like a big cake and um so you go okay. one two three four sorry about the writing Five, no 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 you're absolutely six, fine seven eight let me just slice it for you oh um, and then i will be able to answer your question <laughs> with with clarity so okay so that's the first that's what we call level four yep. five and six okay and so you so you can see you've got eight modules in each yep. stack so when, mm -hmm. when you start the degree, um, you know, before your first layer, you're going to do eight modules. OK, now, if you're on performance based admissions, yeah. uh, you're limited because you haven't exactly met the criteria, the, the standard criteria. Right. Uh, so we rather than sending you off to go and do some A-levels or something and wait two years, we're like, yeah. OK, we'll let you in, but we yeah. have to limit what you can access just to ensure that you're ready for a degree level study, basically. So what cool. we do is we, we give you access to two modules uh and one it'll be one pr the programming module and then yep. you can choose i think you can choose which one of the maths modules there's two maths yes. modules in that set of eight so you mm -hmm. can choose those so in your first session you'd only be able to do two uh, mm -hmm. whereas uh, if you'd gone straight in on the regular pathway you'd do you could do uh four up to four yep. so it just means in your first session you're limited and if if you and, and we choose maths and programming because they're sort of you know they're, they're kind of they tell you 
if someone can do the maths and programming module, then they're good to go, basically. And what happens is if you pass those modules, you can then enroll in your next session on just like anyone else. Amazing. And thank you so much for showing me that amazing table as well. I don't think I've ever seen such straight aligns. I think that's great. <laughs> so as you can, you know, you've heard it from, you know, Dr. Matthew King today. If you're accepted, it doesn't make any difference to your grade, your degree. You're still a University of London student. It just means that you have to do those two modules. And like I said, those modules are compulsory for everyone. Just make sure you pass with 40% or above. But I believe anyone who gets onto that, I'm sure they will. So let's go on to the next most question. Most people do. <laughs> there we go. Most people do. Yeah. See? I mean, so. performance-based admissions. For you. When I look at the people that come in on performance-based admissions, it's mm -hmm. it's literally just because they don't have the piece of paper. I yeah. mean, you've got people who have been working in fintech for mm -hmm. for you know years and, and stuff like that coming in who, are, but they just can't find the GCSE paper or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's yeah, it's just like that. And so it's a really, it's not, and it doesn't appear on your certificate or anything like that. So. No, you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, it's not a trick thing. It's literally to make sure that you feel confident and comfortable. You're not out of your depth. And, you know, the university are there to help you as well. And like, it won't come up on your degree certificate or your transcript. But no, that's great. And thank you. I loved the little table. I think I'll use that in future. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so apart from the programming languages that we've mentioned today, will students learn any other programming languages? Uh, yeah, I'm not, I didn't catch the bit where you were mentioning them because I was fiddling around making this work. So uh, I, <laughs> uh, that's fine. But I'll, I'll just tell you which ones we do and then that's easier, isn't it? So yeah, so um, in level, in the first layer of the cake, <laughs> um, yeah. I can refer back to it now, can't I? So that, uh, <laughs> so we, we start off, actually the, the teaching language in, in the first layer is, is JavaScript. So yeah. we, we work with JavaScript and that allows us to uh, reduce lots of interactive 2D kind of games type programming with that to help you learn it in an interesting interactive way. So that's and we did a bit and we do a bit of web programming in, in the first layer as well. So you do some HTML and CSS, which are kind of languages. Uh, yeah. Then in level five, you continue your web development stuff using JavaScript, but you get into Node.js mm -hmm. and you start using some database languages. Uh, so we use um, um, SQL, I think it's using the MySQL database. Yep, that's right. So it's My MySQL and uh, JavaScript. And we also introduced Python in that in that second layer. And so, but focused on sort of data science-y applications of Python. So it's not a more, it's not like just general Python programming. It's yeah. more focused to prepare you for those data science-y and AI and machine learning modules that you'll see in the final layer. Uh, we also, in, in the second layer, do C++. So, and that's, that's one of my modules actually. Uh, so we, we, we teach C++ and you build kind of, uh, you build some fun applications in C++, a graphical application for DJing and uh, oh, also a, a, a FinTech application for processing cryptocurrency data uh, in the command line. So yeah, so that's the, and then what else do we do? Yeah, so that, those are the main languages, but in, uh, we also then in level six, there's, you, you get to choose optional modules, but some of them, uh, use JavaScript. So there's a React mo mobile development with React module. So that's all JavaScript. Plus you do uh, the some of the Reacty stuff as well. You know that funny version of XML that, that, that React has that I've forgotten the name of. Um, and then you oh J JSX isn't it? Yeah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you do that. And then and then you got uh, more Python in the machine learning modules. You do uh, more JavaScript as well in other modules. So yeah, so we we kind of continue in in that vein really. Oh, that's great. So Unity, quite... sorry, C, a bit of C sharp. If you do the games oriented modules at level six, you will do some C sharp as well, but that's kind of like an easy version of C++. So it shouldn't be any sweat for you <laughs> at that point. That sounds amazing. You cover a lot of programming languages then, which is fab. Do you feel like any of the programming languages will be used in the real world as well? Like Python, I know a lot of students say that they use it at work on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you find sure, that? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so, so we have selected the languages that we know are on the list of languages that everyone's using basically so if you there's an index of programming languages called if you look up tiob t-i-o-b-e there's a yes. tiob index of programming languages and what they do is they gather all kinds of sort of industry data about which programming languages are being talked about which ones are in the jobs and all uh, job listings and all that and, and our languages are all very high up on that list so yeah put it that way that's fantastic. I actually had a colleague who is also answering questions today. Matthew actually mentioned that to us as well. So I'm going to 
um, put that into the chat box so that anyone can see. But yeah, COB is a great indicator, really. All right, fantastic. Let's go on to the next slide, shall we? Great. So I get this question a lot and I'd love to understand a bit more about it myself. So what's the split between video lectures and online reading for this program particularly? Yeah, uh, so in this program, I think we produced about 300 hours of video or something. I haven't properly counted it, but it's a lot. Uh, so each so so each module. So, so, the, so, the, so you do eight modules in that first layer. Each yep. one of those is going to have about 10 hours of video or, or around about there's variation, but roughly yeah. that, right? So you're looking at 80 hours in mm -hmm. that first sort of layer and it carries on like that. So it's quite heavy amount of video, which is why, you know, this studio, we built this studio to, to produce this content and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, also, yeah, there's a lot of reading material. So the University of London has really a, quite a good library, which yeah. gives you access to all kinds of things like uh, in uh, one of my modules, uh, one of the, the software engineering module, I make a lot of use of the library because it has the IEEE Explore library, which uh, for people who do computer science, it's like a massive library of journals and uh, you know conference papers and, and magazines about computing, which you can access the whole thing. Uh, so yeah, so that's it, in terms of how much of it there is, you know, the yeah, I would say it's quite video focused, but we do, especially in the later stages, in the more advanced courses at the end, uh, we do tend to get you going, going off and reading some research papers, but we also have textbooks. So some of the modules follow along on a, text, a textbook, which is in the library and you in electronic form, of course, uh, but although you can, <laughs> can you come to the physical University of London Library? Possibly you might be able to wheel your way in with an ID card. I don't know, but there is a physical library as well, but obviously it's in London. And uh, yeah, so, but the electronic library is, is large and useful and we use it for textbooks and for articles. Uh, but we also send people off to websites and things as well, uh, of course, because, you know, that's whatever resource is the most effective one to use. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And yes, you are correct. There is, you know, the online library that is accessible to all the online students. So you don't need to buy textbooks, which is always great. And you will get given a student ID card. So if you do want to make the trip into London, you can access the library there, the University of London, because you're a University of London student. So why not? I would just say if you are based in a different country and you're maybe visiting London, feel free to drop in. But you don't need to come to the library per se. I, I do like the British Library, but the University of London Library is also great as well. But yeah, it's really down to you. You don't need to worry too much about, you know, trying to access it because it's all online for you anyway. So let's go on to the next slide, shall we? Great. So students have asked, um, they kind of want to understand a bit more about how assessments and exams will be conducted. Are they more, you know, practical tasks or are they mostly theory exams? If you could share some light on this, it'd be great. Yeah. So every module has some practical component, uh, mm. which even even the math, the maths ones, would, it would be more sort of problem solving. Uh, but many of the modules have kind of programming projects and other kinds of things where, where you're kind of building bits of software or experimenting with bits of software. Uh, whatever it is so every module has at least one coursework in the middle and mm. then from there you so some modules will have an exam at the end and some will have a coursework at the end and so so some modules will be doing two courseworks and some you'll be doing a coursework then an exam now uh, in terms of the difference yeah it's courseworks are obviously more um yeah practical uh you, you you'd be building something or but, it's, but some of them are essay based as well. Some of the modules do get you to go off and research something and write some, an essay about it. So, for example, uh, the artificial intelligence module, which is one of my ones, uh, we have a task in the coursework there where you have to go and read some research papers and try and understand what they're talking about and then summarize it back into your report. So we do things like that in courseworks. Now, the exams uh, at the moment, we have a sort of standard format for all exams, which is there's a multiple choice quiz. Uh, which you take and then there are long answers which you then take as well and you kind of I think you have three possible questions and you answer two and yeah it's all done online and recently we at the University of London has, has acquired a new exam system so all of it will be done through that system and so that's happening I think from uh, September this year on, on the programs so yeah people who are joining for the April session would 
be doing exams on that new system. Yeah, so you kind of log into a thing, it presents you with an exam paper and you type your exam answers in and, and put them in. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, sorry, I didn't really answer what the questions are like. They are, so yeah, mostly they are kind of theory based, but you do okay. have things where you have to write chunks of code, but it's quite difficult to assess people's handwritten code often. Yeah, so, uh, having, you know, I've marked a lot of that and that's not easy, uh, but you know, people tend yeah. to type it. But so yeah, we, we do a bit of code, but it's more sort of uh, thinking uh, more design uh, system level, thinking about how things fit together or um, think, talking about something you've read uh, from, from the reading list and things like that. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. And um, I was going to understand as well with the exams, are students given like, you know, plenty of time and warning beforehand? Like, do they know when the exams will be? Because I know exams are always going to be at the end of every module, which will be around March and September. But will yeah. they know what date just so they can like pre-plan any time off work or, you know, time for schedules and so forth? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, we we published an exam timetable university of london's sort of assessment team published an exam timetable uh, before the exams start and there obviously there's kind of limitations on on how far in advance they're able to publish that and because a lot of interaction between the exams and stuff like that like yeah. but yeah that does get published so you do know and also you do get a reasonable time to do the exam so typically uh, we do something so the current pattern that we're using on the exams in terms of timing is yeah. it'll be it'll be uh, it'll be open for a 24 hour period yeah. and within that period you have to do each component within four hours so you can start at any point in that period and then when you start you then get four hours to finish the components okay amazing so it gives you some time as well which is really good to understand so thank you for describing that in detail um, let's go on to our final question that we have from students. Ah, so our last question, Matthew, is do you have any advice or tips for students when applying for the programme? Um, just make sure you give the best, most accurate information that you can to avoid kind of cycles of, of going back round because, you know, obviously the, the longer that if you miss documents out, then you just have that's just another cycle to go through. So, yeah, just try and gather all the information that you can. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So thank you for answering all the questions. They have been fab. I really appreciate it. We now are going on to the section for live Q&As. So if we go on to the next slide. So I can see that we have a lot of questions from students today and we're going to try to answer them as much as we can over the next 15 minutes. So I can see some really fantastic questions. I'm just going to try to find a few questions that we can go through and then we can answer together. Does that sound okay, Matthew? Yeah. So you're going to field them and I'll... Uh... Yeah, sure. Let's go uh, through yeah. some together. Why don't we? Okay. I, there's so many fantastic questions. I don't even know which one to choose. <laughs> Okay, so let's go through this, shall we? Right, let's have a look. Oh, I don't know if we can answer this, but I thought it might be a good idea. What kind of jobs does this degree lead to? What kind of percentage of students are able to find employment? Yeah, I, I don't have at my fingertips employment data, but uh, what I do have is I, I can talk about this, the sort of the way we've design the specialisms for different kind of out, you know, exit uh, jobs, if you like. So I, I do know this uh, you know, so more informally. I, I, I've had contact with students who, who are now working at Google and, you know, wow. we're, we're, we're getting people into the big, the big companies um, and people are doing really well. But and people, uh, people are doing applying for masters. I know quite a, we've had our first set of graduates earlier last wow. year and Many of them apply for master's courses. I know some of them are now studying for master's and one is on PhD. So yeah, there's in terms of academics, further study. I, I know a bit more about that because I tend end up sort of helping out sometimes with that stuff. But uh, yeah, so that's that. But in terms of the sort of design of the degree and how we've kind of set it up for employability, um, we, 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 the degree has specialist pathways. So when, when you sign up, you can choose whether you want to do sort of a computer science degree and go all the way through on, on that path. And in which case, when you hit level six, which is the final layer, uh, you get to choose whichever options you want. Uh, but if you're not sure, we got sort of, I think, 14 options or something at level six. So there's loads of different modules you can choose from. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, if you're not sure which ones you want or you want to know which are the best ones in order to do a certain thing, we've created these kind of recipes which say if you want to do a mobile development or uh, and kind of web development, then here's the set of modules that go well together. So like user experience and React and advanced web dev would all go on that and, and you'd be given those. Uh, or if you want to do machine learning and, and machine learning engineering and that kind of stuff, AI stuff, then there's a set of modules that would the target is on that and similarly for games as well we've got those so yeah so what we and that's one feature of the degree which sort of helps you kind of target a particular career pathway that you think you're interested in um and the other thing is is there's a really good career service at the university of london and it's just the last year or so they've really pumped some cash into it frank to put it frankly and uh, <laughs> there's a great person liz who, who we've been talking to a lot who's running with that and they're, they're doing all kinds of uh, webinars for careers so drop-in sessions all kinds of stuff so there's lots of places where you can get kind of real-time live feedback on about jobs and things like that thank you that's fantastic and i think i know um what you're referring to is the london uh, university of london's career services i'm actually dropping the website into the chat box below so you guys can all see it but it is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'd really recommend that people review this. The University of London's Career Services is great. So thanks for that, Matthew. Um, okay, I have a few more questions. Um, Michael Stump has asked, is there a recommended order in which the, to take the modules for this degree? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think, um, again, I haven't seen the user interface, but I've certainly given advice to, to the designers of that thing as, as a sort of a recommended pattern. Uh, but you know, it, it does depend on what speed you're going at. So the minimum speed is two modules per session. So in that case, you know, you you, the, the, you would you, you, it's kind of flexible what you do to some extent, I'd say. Uh, but the maximum speed is four modules, and in that case, uh, in in the layer in the first layer, you probably don't want to be doing two maths modules at a time. So mm -hmm. you probably want to do uh, say the pro first programming module, a maths module, the web dev module, and then you can either choose how computers work or fundamentals. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that would be the first set of four. And then the second set of four, you do all the other ones that are on level four. Yeah. Uh, and then, then the next level, uh, I guess the main thing I would comment on is that there are two new programming languages that appear in, in level five. So you've got C++ okay. and Python appearing. And you probably don't, unless you've done one of those before and you're really confident, you probably mm -hmm. don't want to be doing them, learning them both in the same session. So mm -hmm. I would, that's one thing I would do in two separate sittings, the, uh, the data programming with Python and the object-oriented programming module. And then at level six, it's kind of open season because they're fairly independent, those modules. Yeah. Uh, but you always do the final project in your last session because that's a bigger module that you do that's supposed to be the kind of capstone of the whole thing. Yeah, agreed. And the final project, everyone, is worth 30 credits. So, you know, have a think about that as well. But thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we have another question here from Jessica Vaughan. She said, how do you track grades? Is there a specific GPA system that would be used by the university? Uh, yeah, so um, the so all the grades end up in a system called uh, SITS. And then what happens is we, um, at the end of every sort of assessment session, so every six months, basically, we have an exam board where we go through all the stats of all of everybody's grades and you know so they're actually percentages so you, you you'll get a percentage for each module and that's broken into which of the two assessments exam and coursework or coursework coursework you got that for and you know and then eventually uh, you end up uh, at the end of the degree and then you'll be placed into a different degree classification based on a summed ratio of your grades so the the first layer of the degree now i'm i'm, I'm i think the ratio is um um, one three five, but I'm not 100%. It's in the regulations, but it's yeah. like so. It's one three five. So one, the weighting of the first layer, yeah. three, the weighting of the second layer, and five, the weighting of the final layer. So the final layer has more weight than the other ones, and yeah. So that's how it works. And then you get classified into the standard UK degree classification boundaries. Uh, so you have got um, fail, pass, third class degree, sec uh, second. Uh, two two class degree if you like um, and yep. then two one and then a first yes so all the degree classifications for the uk so if anyone does want to look into that it is listed in the program regulation book we can put that into the chat box below as well um but thank you matthew i appreciate that we do have a question from promise um i'm more than happy to help this on this question as well it's 
is the degree cert certificate acceptable worldwide? Is there anything on the certificate that indicates a difference in the physical and online group? So I promise just to let you know, this degree is exactly the same as you would be studying on campus. It doesn't state that it's online, doesn't state on your transcripts or your degree certificate. So, and because this is studied at the University of London, it is qualified as a level six qualification as well. So it's considered a UK honors bachelor's degree. Okay. Oh, I have a question here from an anonymous attendee. Um, what is the policy for students who perform poorly in a specific course? Are they allowed to retake the course in which they have poor academic performance? Uh, yes, uh, is the short answer. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you get a certain number of attempts to retake. And if so, if you fail, and it, you can also um, choose to sit your assessment in a different session. So we call that an alternative session request where let's say things aren't going too well or suddenly you get a load more stuff on at work or family or whatever, you can say, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna be going, I'm not gonna be ready to do the assessment this session. I'd like to do it next session and you can do that. Uh, so it's, it's fairly flexible in that way. That's good, I'm glad. So don't panic and worry guys. If you do, just remember that you have that in place. Yeah, don't crash out, just communicate. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> Communication yeah. is the biggest thing, yeah. And the University of London are there to support you and help and guide you. So, you know, talk to someone, reach out to them, and they should be able to get back to you on that. We want you to succeed as much as we can. Okay, so I can see that we have about five more minutes. So let's go through one or two more questions. I'm going to give really short answers to these ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try to find a few more. Oh, I have one here from Slava. Is the course mostly consisting of group or individual projects? Is there, if the group projects are included in this, how are students being allocated into these groups? Mostly individual and uh, mostly randomly. Brilliant. I love that. Random and individually. Wonderful. Okay. Let's go on to another one, if that's okay. I think we've only got a few more minutes left. So um, I just wanted to understand. Um, ah, Starvi has asked, is the in-person graduation separated by in-person versus online or do all students graduate the same way? Oh, so we've got our first in-person graduation in March. And uh, so it, it, there, there's no separation in, in that sense, no. Um, it's University of London students graduate. It's actually at the Barbican, which is a really nice venue in London this year. So I'm quite looking forward to that. Oh, lovely, I was gonna say. And hopefully it will be lovely weather and it's not raining either. Fingers crossed for UK weather. Um, but we have quite a few people asking if they can get a video of the webinar. Yes, you will. You'll get a copy of this afterwards. So do not worry. This will be emailed over to you. If you have not been able to attend, you can watch it back um, afterwards. It's not a problem. Okie dokie. So I just have, let's go through one more question, shall we, Matthew? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Juan has asked, uh, question about exams. Can all exams be taken on, online or some exams required to be taken in person? They're all online at the moment, yes. And not, as I'm not aware of any plan to stop that, yep. but if any plan emerges, obviously we'll communicate that. Absolutely. And I know quite a few people are asking about exams. So just to clarify, exams are always going to take place at the end of every module. So that's always going to be around March and September. Exams are being taken place online, like Matthew's just said. So and they'll always be about two hours in length and you have about 24 hours to get that time committed as well. So make sure you're in a nice, quiet room, no distractions, and you can go through those as well. But okay, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. So thank you so much, Matthew, for your time. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. And thank you for answering all these lovely questions from our students. Thank you. Yeah, great to, great to meet you too. And good luck to everyone with their applications. Yes, absolutely. So like I said, guys, application deadline is going to be on March 13th. So make sure you get your applications in before then. If you want to book a meeting with an enrollment counsellor today, you can by scanning the QR code with your phone and you can just click through those questions and book a meeting in with one of us. But thank you. I think that's all the time that we have for today. So if we go on to the next slide. You can see here all the key dates for the application deadline, March 13th, registration deadline is March 27th, and the classes start on April 17th. So 
I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you for everyone attending today. Anyone's questions that we haven't answered, we will do our best to answer them afterwards. And like I said, book a meeting in with an enrollment counsellor. But I wish you the best of luck. Speak to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.